Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Prabhupada, 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 Jaya Prabhupada. Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada. Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada. Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada. Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prams Goho Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Dinchananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Sri Vasti Gaur Bhakta Rindiki Jai Sri Sri Radha Krishna Gopa Gopira Shama Kunda Radha Kunda Giri Govardhan Ki Jai Sri Vandavan Dham Ki Jai Nabhadab Dham Ki Jai Ganga Shimon Atosi Bhakta Devi Ki Jai Ananda Koti Vaishnava Rindiki Jai Samabhata Bhakta Rindiki Jai Ngo Premanandi all glories they some of the bodies, all glories they some of the bodies, all glories they some of the bodies, all glories she grew and she grung, all glories she loved Rabupad. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Nama Om Vishnu Badaya Krishna Bhastaya Bhutale Shimate Bhaktivedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Saraswata Devi Gauravani Prachadane Nirvashesha Shunyavadi Pashtatadesha Tadane Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Reading from Shema Bhav and Candles 7, chapter 15, verse 15. Dharma Aratam Api Neheta. Yataratam Avadanodhanam. Anihan Iha Manasya. Mahaher Eva Vritada. In religion or economic development, happy. Indeed, no, not. Iheta. I should try to obtain. 
Yatra Artam. Just to maintain the body and soul together. Ava. Either. Adhana. One who has no wealth. Adhanam. Money. Aniha. Desirelessness. Aniha Manasya. Of a person who does not endeavor even to earn his livelihood. <coughs> Maha Ahe. A great serpent known as the python. Eva. Like. Vrittida. Which obtains its livelihood without endeavor. Translation. Even if a man is poor, he should not endeavor to improve his economic condition and just to maintain his body and soul together or to become a famous religionist. Just as a great python, although lying in one place, not endeavoring for its livelihood, gets the food it needs to maintain body and soul, one who is desireless also obtains his livelihood without endeavor. Purport. Human life is simply meant for developing Krishna consciousness. One need not even try to earn a livelihood to maintain his body and soul together. This is illustrated here by the example of the great python, which lies in one place, never going here and there to earn livelihood to maintain itself, and yet it is maintained by the grace of the Lord. As advised by Narada Muni, Chasaiva Heto Prayateta Kovila. One should simply endeavor to increase his Krishna consciousness. One should not desire to do anything else, even to earn his livelihood. There are many, many examples of this attitude. Madhavendra Puri, for instance, would never go to anyone to ask for food. Sukhada Goswami has also uh, said, Kasmat Bhajanti Kavayo Dana. Uh, Durmad Andan. Uh, one, why should one approach a person who is blind with wealth? Rather, one should depend on Krishna, and he will give everything. All the members of our Krishna consciousness movement, whether they be grihasas or sannyasis, should try to spread the Krishna consciousness movement with determination, and Krishna will supply all necessities. The process of Ajagaravriti, the means of livelihood of a python, is very much appreciated in this regard. Even though one may be very poor, he should simply try to advance in Krishna consciousness and not endeavor to earn his livelihood. So in spite of the fact that this whole chapter is about how to maintain yourself <laughs> by working, <laughs> either as a sudra, a vaisha, a kshatriya, or a brahmana. Here we find an opposite statement, don't do any of this. Huh? An example is given of the python, uh, which I think they must exist in India. They have pythons in India? I think they have in Africa and the uh, Amazon jungle or something. Some of them are very huge, maybe 30 feet long. And they can even swallow a deer. <laughs> and they'll digest it for one month. <laughs> but uh, they simply sit there, like with their mouth open, like Agasura. <laughs> and anything that wanders in, they swallow it. <laughs> uh, so this is an example of uh, not making too much endeavor uh, to maintain one's body and survive in the material world. You just kind of sit there. And there's an example of a, a Python devotee, that is uh, um, Prahlad. Uh, when he was the king, he met one person uh, who was doing this, uh, Avriti, acting like a Python. So he would just lie down on the ground or just sit there, and if people brought food, he would eat. If they didn't bring food, he wouldn't eat, like that. So, of course, he was a very renounced person. So, uh, This is more or less what we call the uh, conduct of, an, of a Dutta. Uh, who is a person completely detached from the material world and doesn't really care about his body or anything. So he makes no endeavor to maintain himself and whatever comes, comes. Uh, so, um, and we see the example like Jadbarat, uh, 
uh, or Rishabhadev in his old, and when he retired, he was like this. Uh, it's a very extreme type of renunciation. Uh, we can say like the um, sannyasi who was a Paramahamsa. Huh? He just wanders around and the food comes, he takes it, or doesn't come, he doesn't take it. So it's a very renounced stage. And we cannot expect everybody to follow that. Huh? And that is why they do have a Varnashram system, because most people are not capable of renouncing everything. Huh? So, therefore, we do have this whole system of Varnashram described. Uh, based mainly on Grihasta life, which is exactly the opposite of this uh, sitting there and just taking whatever comes, because as a Grihasta, you have to plan to protect yourself and your family. So then you actually need an occupation to do that. You need some sustenance for yourself and your family. Uh, uh, so uh, this whole system of Varnashram is for all those people who are doing that. Uh, so we have the Sudras who are in Tamagun, they have family, and they support their family by employment. They work for others. And we have the Vaishas, family, man, and uh, he doesn't work for others. He has his own business if he's a merchant. Or he's a cowherd and he has his own herd of cows. Or farm, whatever. And we have the Kshatriyas. They have their families. They maintain their families by controlling, ruling over the land, uh, getting taxes, etc. Um, making sure Dharma is intact. And then we have the Brahmana. Uh, the Brahmanas are also Grihastas in general. Uh, and uh, they also support their family. They have different um, means of doing that, uh, which are also mentioned in this section also and later in the Bhagavatam. Uh, uh, but they never get employed by others, and, uh, which is the Sudra job. And uh, they never willingly like take... Um, money like that. So it's only by donation. <laughs> so they teach and they get donation for that, not charges, you know, not fee. Donation. Uh, so, uh, in this way they maintain their, so themselves and their family. So everybody in that system is maintained, more or less, yes? uh, somehow or other, either by self-employment, by donation, or by employment, the suitors. Uh, so that is the majority of the people but the Varna Ashram is a little special in this regard, which will distinguish it from, I'd say, Europe. They also had the Sudras, they were the slaves, more or less, the people, you know, employed by them. They didn't have their own land or anything. Then we have the landowners, and then we have the king, like that. They didn't have Brahmins, really, but maybe they had the priests, <laughs> the Catholic priests or something. Uh, but there was a semblance of some sort of, you know, Varnas there also. But the distinguishing factor of the Varnashram system is that ultimately, though it's a little bit indirect, the goal is spiritual and to elevate people through the gunas to sattva guna and from sattva guna to liberation at least, artha, dharma, kama, and moksha. Yeah. So everybody in the system knows uh, moksha, liberation, no, they don't quite understand why it's there, but they understand what it means, you know, it means liberation uh, beyond birth and death, etc. Even the Sudra will understand that, I think, in the Varnashram system when he hears the word moksha. If you were to say liberation in another country of the world, they won't understand it. <laughs> they're in this system, but there's artha, dharma, kama, and no moksha. <laughs> That's their system. <laughs> So in that sense, the Varnashram system is a little unique because putting all this endeavor, Artha, Dharma, Kama, and then it says give it all up. <laughs> so obviously, why would give up? Because it's a higher level, spiritual level. You have to understand you're not the body or the soul, etc. So in that sense, Varnashram system is unique because its, it's basis is ultimately spiritual, getting out of the material world, <laughs> which is exactly opposite of what the whole system is doing. Other systems in the world are just there, uh, endeavoring to enjoy or whatever. Uh, so, uh, and uh, to um, implement that system, then there's rules. 
And uh, there's rules, according to, as I said, the Varnos to have different rules to do that. And if this implemented properly, then over many births you should elevate through the gunas to sattva guna. And when you're sattva guna, you become a brahmana, then you inquire about moksha. <laughs> so in that sense, you get that far up to moksha. But few people. So everything is actually, all the other people are more involved in artha dharma kama. So, how is it possible to institute this? Okay, don't endeavor at all. Just act like a python and sit there and open your mouth and if something comes, <laughs> it comes. If it doesn't come, it doesn't come. How are you going to support your family? Uh, what, how are the majority of people going to follow this principle? Actually impossible. And that's such a thing as usually recommended not even for normal sannyasi. It's only for a very advanced sannyasi. Or someone who's so elevated, he's parbahams, which means you know, gone beyond everything. Huh? But this uh, verse is here just to emphasize the fact that even if one is in the Varnashram system and is pursuing Artha, Dharma, Kama, and supporting family, etc., one should never forget that the whole endeavor actually is temporary. And thus, you have to include that you know, moksha in there also higher endeavor should be there. Huh? In other words, don't forget about the moksha even if you're not, not interested in it right now. Huh? So you're, you're so much involved in Artha Dhamma Kama, but don't forget, ultimately, you should have this goal. So therefore, we have verses like that. Just if everybody should just be detached from everything and act like a python. They can't do it, but at least they should understand that ultimately, whole material world is useless. And that is exactly what the Bhagavatam emphasizes, even Bhagavad Gita will emphasize that also. Uh, this material world is Dukalaya Masaswatam. Everything is full of misery and everything is temporary. So you should give it up ultimately. Uh, but again, <laughs> Krishna also recommends, okay, do karma yoga. That's best for everybody. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, the system uh, Varna Ashram does emphasize maintaining your body, but according to rules and regulations, with that higher goal, that eventually you renounce everything. Yeah? So therefore we'll have a verse like this to emphasize that. Yeah. So we should not uh, take uh, verses independently. We should see the context of all of these different verses. Otherwise we get very confused about uh, what is happening here. After discussing all this, I said, well, don't do it at all. It looks like contradictions. So we have to uh, explain the function of these uh, uh, verses uh, so their meaning will somewhat change and not be uh, just uh, literal. Uh, uh, so therefore, the meaning is not that everybody should give up whatever they're doing and uh, act like a python and just uh, not endeavor at all. Yeah. So, that is one thing. Huh? Uh, the other factor, of course, is bhakti. So, if one takes to the process of bhakti, uh, more or less, one also adopts this attitude to some degree. Uh, uh, we say, uh, Bhagavatam says, that if you develop faith, in the topics of Krishna, then uh, you should give up karma yoga <laughs> and attachment to it. Uh, to the extent that you have that attraction for the topics of Krishna, in other words, to the extent that you're serious about bhakti yoga, to that extent you give up all your duties in Varnashram system. Huh? So therefore, uh, there is, um, you can say, bhakti yoga itself is pointing in this direction of giving up everything. And that's why at the end of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Sarva Dharman Parijaja. Give up karma yoga, gan yoga, and astanga yoga, even. Huh? Uh, so, uh, the, 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 the sense of renunciation is more extreme. Uh, this type of uh, python occupation. Uh, is usually associated with those striving for liberation. Uh, but those striving for bhakti even give up this, <laughs> the liberation part of it. <laughs> uh, so, 
uh, they also are detached, like the Python people, but uh, they're not really attached to that process of simply giving up, because that usually ends up with uh, liberation. So therefore, vairagya, or detachment from material things, is not considered to be part of bhakti. It's not an anga of bhakti. Uh, when you do that, you mix that in, and then you, you get mixed, uh, liberation gets mixed in there, and that weakens the bhakti. Uh, so, anyway, there is a sense of vairagya within bhakti itself. Uh, and it's a little bit strange because jnana and yoga have implicit vairagya or detachment, renunciation in their whole process. Huh? And you have to give up everything. And thus we see the yogis are sitting in the Himalayas, something like the python. <laughs> uh, and the ganis are, you know, uh, doing vratas and fasts, etc. Uh, the uh, devotees, however, uh, we say, okay, uh, vairagya is not part of the practice of bhakti at all. A renunciation uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, that such detachment is not there. On the other hand, we say you engage all your senses. Instead of stopping all your senses, you engage all your senses. <laughs> and this, of course, is, I'd say, easier. It's easier to engage your senses uh, and get spiritual advancement than stopping your senses and getting advancement. And thus, the process of bhakti is considered to be easier than the process of jnana or yoga, simply for that reason. So, therefore, that vairagya is not an essential part of bhakti, but uh, it's also the natural result of bhakti. One naturally becomes detached from material things. So the whole secret is how we engage the senses. If we normally engage the senses in sense objects, we end up making karma, enjoying the material world, and creating more bondage for ourselves. So we sink in the gunas. <laughs> Varnashram system is there is to put some control on that at least. It doesn't stop the sense engagement, but it restricts you so you avoid the sinful activities as much as possible. And you do the punya activities, and then you could enjoy in a restricted way and survive in the material world. But of course, it does not destroy your bondage. And then when we get to Gyan and Yoga, severe restrictions on the sense enjoyment. Stop the senses, stop the mind, etc. Hmm? And then in the process of bhakti, employ the, don't stop the senses, don't stop the mind. <laughs> but, and you're supposed to get advancement also, so how does that work? It works because the object of our senses is not material. It is Krishna and things related to Krishna, which are non-material, and thus, and we engage our senses in something spiritual, it does not cause bondage. Rather, it destroys bondage. Uh, so the object of our uh, senses and our mind are different from a normal person. But the other factor is not just the object is different, the intent is different. Yeah. If Krishna is the object and we have a desire to enjoy Krishna, then that's not proper. <laughs> that's not bhakti anymore. <laughs> so, uh, Krishna is the object, spiritual object, but because it is a spiritual object, <coughs> we cannot say, I want to enjoy. Huh? Rather, uh, we are serving the Supreme Lord for his enjoyment. And that's the proper attitude we have. Uh, of course, we can always argue, well, how is that possible? Uh, you, you don't want anything for yourself. You're not trying to get any sense gratification, not trying to get any enjoyment, and you do all your activities. Well, how is that possible? Because we do activities because we want something for ourselves. <laughs> and that's the whole problem. When we do that, we end up with karma, further bondage. So how is it possible to do activities without any expectation of enjoyment at all? And the only answer to that is love, pure love. And in pure love, you do something without any expectations. Huh? But that can never be expressed in the material world <laughs> because our mind is a subject on a material object. Huh? 
So the only pure object, a suitable object uh, for that love is the Supreme Lord. Yeah. So, therefore, uh, bhakti is directed to the Lord, it becomes prema. And that is, uh, that is the, uh, we can say, the only way in which we can do that selfless type of service is because of that intention of pure love. Unfortunately, we start at the beginning with very little bhakti, very little faith, and a lot of material attractions. <laughs> so that is why the beginnings of bhakti become a little difficult. But the process of bhakti is such, it's so powerful that it's able to overcome and destroy all of these obstacles, all of these material attachments. Eh? So we have the process called anartana vritti. Eh? So this acts as the vairagya. <laughs> as we progress in bhakti, we become more and more detached from that material enjoyment. And how is that? Because we're practicing the opposite. We're practicing giving the enjoyment to Krishna. <laughs> so the more we develop the bhakti, the less we have this desire to enjoy for ourselves. This is like an automatic process. Uh, if, if we go this side, this is, size is going to decrease. The more we get bhakti, the less material attachments. More attachment for Krishna, less attachment for material things. Hmm? So that is the process of bhakti. So the process of bhakti is natural vairagya. Uh, how the detachment takes place, not as a practice in itself, by just stopping your senses, but uh, by in employing your senses and serving Krishna with bhakti, one naturally becomes detached from everything in the material world. And the more advanced one becomes, the more vairagya becomes manifest in that devotee. And if one is in prema, zero attachment for anything in the material world. So, he will also act like the python. <laughs> Not because he's trying to get liberation or trying to control his senses, but simply because he's completely absorbed in Krishna. That's all. And he's forgetting. He forgets all about his material body. Okay. So, this natural vairagya as a result of complete absorption in Krishna. So he has no attachment to his material body at all. So therefore, whatever is accomplished by these persons in the Varnashram system, or as sannyasis, or as avadutas, or whatever, trying to get liberation, that similar type of detachment results in bhakti, but not as a goal, but simply as a side effect of their 100% attachment to Krishna. So, in the beginning of bhakti, uh, we're not advised to practice such uh, extreme renunciation. But uh, it's not that we also encourage everybody to uh, enjoy like anything in the material world. <laughs> uh, so, uh, therefore, we practice bhakti, and to some degree we have to restrict the senses, etc. That's why we have four regulated principles, so we can you know, restrict the senses, because the more we indulge in sense gratification, the more that pulls us back. It's like the, uh, uh, the man with the, uh, on the boat and he has the anchor in the water and he's trying to go up the river and nothing happens <laughs> because the anchor is there. Huh? So uh, we're trying to go to Krishna, trying to get complete attachment to Krishna, but as long as we hold on to the material objects, uh, material attachments, and we have no intention of giving them up, it's very difficult to advance in bhakti. Hmm? So along with the faith in our initial pro, um, uh, activities of bhakti, there has to be an intention of not enjoying so much in the material world. <laughs> it's not good for you. Uh, the more you do that, the more you impede your bhakti. Huh? So we have one of the offenses of the holy name, tenth one. Yeah? After understanding, getting the philosophical aspect of, you know, this is maya, not good for you, worship Krishna, etc. After understanding all of that, still you're attached to the material things. <laughs> you can't give up the attachment. So that becomes an offense. You get so strongly attached that whatever you do in bhakti is cancelled out. It's like the man with the anchor in the boat and he's doing everything but nothing happens. So, uh, therefore, uh, we do have to have this attitude to that. Um, 
even if we do have the attachments, we have to understand that they are not uh, favorable for devotional development. They'll impede the bhakti like anything. So, uh, we can't indulge in them uh, because that will act to give us more attachment to them and therefore we cannot advance in devotional service. So therefore we have rules and regulations uh, restricting our enjoyment to some degree. Hmm. Uh, so that's our vairagya <laughs> uh, in the beginning. And if one advances, then one can be more detached. And as I said in prema, then naturally one will have extreme detachment from everything in the material world. Uh. Uh. Okay, any question there? Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the class. I just wanted to, because uh, I feel like um, the word attachment uh, for a lot of us can be quite vague, especially coming in if we're especially if we're new to yeah. spiritual stuff So my question is how how do you define? Attachment what is it? What's the process of it? Like and and how to also like detach from it from a practical standpoint even from like even as immediate as the mind not necessarily like I hope that I'm making some kind of sense anyway. Well, yeah, the word attachment, of course, has a, a very wide <laughs> usage. Uh, generally, I guess in Sanskrit, we say raga, huh? and the opposite is dvesha. So we have attachment or hatred. Uh, and these two impulses in the mind will impel us to do activities. Huh? So we may do activities out of hatred, anger, whatever, because uh, we don't like something. Why we don't like something? Because it gives us pain or it impedes our enjoyment or whatever. Yeah? I can't get my enjoyment so I hate that or whatever. <laughs> or it just is disgusting because it gives a little bit of discomfort or whatever so we hate. <laughs> so that's one thing. We do activities to counter that, <laughs> whatever it is. And the other is the raga attachment. We are attached to things because they give us enjoyment. We get some pleasure of some sort, mental, physical, whatever, whatever. So that's the raga, uh, which are functions of the mind. <laughs> uh, so based on the, uh, uh, I would say, the uh, attachment and repulsion, we are impelled to do activities. Uh, and these are directed towards persons or objects in the material world. Uh, and any of these actions will create karma, and karma will create bondage, and push us into another body in ignorance. <laughs> so this is why the attachment is so, let's say, attachment and repulsion are, uh, let's say, detrimental to a spiritual advancement because it covers us over with ignorance. Huh? So what is this attachment and uh, uh, repulsion or whatever? As I said, uh, it's this desire, ultimately, there's the two sides of the same thing. Uh, uh, that uh, attachment and repulsion, obviously one's positive and one's negative. The core of all of that is uh, that the jiva, the atma, has this desire to independently enjoy himself. <laughs> so that's the real raga in the jiva. And that bubbles up into the mind, uh, which is material. And then we have the senses and the body, etc. And then the, the mind tries to fulfill that desire to enjoy through the body and the senses, mm. contacting sense objects in the world. Huh? And that sends some impulses back to the brain and say, well, I'm enjoying or whatever like that, or I'm not getting enjoyment. And based on that feedback, then we start doing more activities to get more enjoyment if we didn't get the enjoyment. And, like this, and then we keep trying like that life after life after life and we keep covering ourselves with more and more you know illusions and more and more bodies and more and more impressions that keep pushing us into lifetimes to try to get that enjoyment all based upon the soul or the Abba trying to enjoy trying to get his satisfaction but he's uh, completely different from the body because he's spiritual so ultimately, it's not satisfying. It's like <laughs> he's satisfying himself only by misidentification with the body. Mm. And the misidentification is caused by 
ahankara, the false ego. So that's kind of the core ignorance of the covering the jiva with the false ego, and then he identifies as the body, and the body starts trying to get the enjoyment, whatever, and like that. And he says, "I'm enjoying," but the soul's there; it actually can't get any enjoyment because it's a false thing. It's, it's, a, it's a material interaction, and the soul is spiritual. So that's why there's always this dissatisfaction with material enjoyment. But the jiva never realizes this because his ahankara is so strong. <laughs> But never, this is the souls kind of sitting there doing nothing, uh, like the, the bird in the cage. Uh, uh, the, the, the foolish person has the bird in the cage, and he's so attracted to the cage that he decorates the cage, and puts gilding all over it, puts jewels all over it, but he doesn't feed the bird inside the cage. <laughs> so that's like the body, this is doing everything with the body, but the soul's there, and it's not getting any satisfaction at all. Uh, because you can't make that distinction between soul and body. Uh, so therefore, the, that uh, original desire to enjoy is there, which causes the raga, which surfaces in the mind, makes us, you know, take objects in the material world, and get karma, and then we get covered over in that way. So that's why the attachment is so, uh, let's say, detrimental. Huh? It keeps covering us up. However, it looks very difficult to get out of that, especially that misidentification with the body, which is so subtle that we don't even know it's there. But it is like, uh, like a dream. In a dream, you identify with a dream. When you wake up, oh, that wasn't me after all. So the whole world is like that. It's like the dream. <laughs> We're in that dream world, and I think this body. In the next lifetime, I think another body. Next life, I think another body. So it's like we're going from movie to movie to movie, and we're, <laughs> we're looking there, but we think we're in the movie each time. <laughs> so it's, it's, you get some excitement, but it's actually not real because it's not, it's not the real you. you know, you're separate from that. But we go through all these experiences because of that desire, attachment, desire to get the enjoyment. Thank you, Maharaj. So the opposite is, uh, of course, the let's cut out the attachment and we solve the problem. Uh, let's get rid of the ahankar, solve the problem. So that was the process of jnana and yoga. Uh, and we do that by stopping the body, stopping the senses, and acting like the python, <laughs> and stop everything. <laughs> uh, reduce our desires. If it comes, it comes. If it doesn't come, it doesn't come. So we have less desire, less desire. So we minimize our desires, minimize our actions, minimize our sense actions, etc. Then we reduce our karma, reduce desire. Finally, we dissolve the hunger, we get out of the material world. So that's the process there. But difficult to do. Other process is, okay, soul itself has got the desire to enjoy in the material world. That's all, I say, uh, it's a big illusion, <laughs> causes us to get the body, etc. But instead of having that raga, that attachment, soul can have attachment to Krishna. <laughs> and we, that's the bhakti yoga process. By doing that, we destroy all the ahankara, the attachment, the material, the uh, karmas, all that stuff gets destroyed. And as our uh, attachment to Krishna grows more and more, that keeps growing and growing. The attachment to the material things decreases, decreases, decreases. So we don't just destroy attachment, we just transfer the attachment to Krishna instead of material things. <laughs> and, but that's natural to the soul. And we don't have to take a body to develop our attraction for Krishna, we get a spiritual body for that. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, uh, Prabhupada often quotes uh, this other Hitopadesh uh, verse saying, Nai uh, suptasya simhasya pravashanti mukhe mriga. That is, even a lion in the forest has to endeavor to get his food. <laughs> it's like it can't lie just because he's the king of the animal kingdom, he can't just sit and expect the food to come to him. Yeah. But on the other hand, we see verses like opposite. this. Yes, opposite. Complete opposite. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, That's why we have the, uh, in, in the Varnashram system, no one can be inactive. Everybody has to work. You have a Varna, you have to work in that Varna to support yourself. Don't be lazy. <laughs> uh, so the idea is that, of course, no one, uh, even the jiva cannot be absolutely, you know, motionless or active or whatever. Uh, but in the material world, as long as we've got the body, we do have to act to support the body. That's just a natural 
part of what existed, struggle for existence, so to speak. You have to maintain your body. So you have to do activity like that. Uh, so uh, the Varna Ashram system is there to regulate that activity so that uh, you don't commit excessive karmas and therefore you don't have to uh, suffer so much. So it provides a peaceful society, so to speak, uh, at long term. Yeah? Because uh, everybody in the system commits less karmas, uh, less sinful activities, so long term the society gets all the punya <laughs> and it can prosper. Yeah? But it's based on activity. A, a, avoid the sinful activity, do the pious activity or the punya. You support the body because you have to survive, but do it with punyas, not with sinful activities. So it's based on activity, your activity. And the system doesn't expect everybody to be like the python. They do have to do activities. And that's why they have varnas, occupational deities. And only for the few, uh, the few, very, very few, the Paramahamsa sannyasis, <laughs> they can follow this vritti, what everybody else is yeah, doing the activity in the material world. So, so the general principle is to endeavor, but this is like an exception for... Well, yeah, as I said, yeah, that's the highest thing, ultimate. It's like that's the ultimate goal, but it's not that everybody can immediately do it. Thank you. Thank you for the class. Um, I was thinking about the the need of implementation of Varna Ashram in the current society because yesterday, today you mentioned that as far as one can progress in bhakti, so much one can reject or one should reject the Varna Ashram yeah. rules. Yeah. Now, uh, from yesterday's class, we understood that it is, it's actually difficult. It's not very clear whether Prabhu was instructed to Inside or outside? Yeah, out, yeah inside and outside. How much and how to do it. Exactly. Now, outside from your statement, it looks like Prabhupada didn't, in, uh, didn't instruct so much to get into politics and, you know, changing the system. So it could look more like an internal model. Yeah. And in that, uh, say, previously there have been endeavors to establish Varnashram kind of in a farm setting. You know, some devotees who are inclined for farming, they do farming, and those who are inclined to teaching, they will teach. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. that kind of a system. Yeah. Is, is that what we are looking at? That is one thing. And yeah. also, when it comes to, uh, when they're using this Varnashram rules, say, recently I was going through this Urmila Mataji's book, uh, Kariya Dharma, mm. in that uh, she uses this uh, uh, guna and karma, basically, you know, she uses a different terminology so that it is not it will not give a preconceived idea like, you know, Shudra is okay. artistry, artistry, yeah. Yeah. government is Kshatriya, resources, yeah. Vaishya, and uh, Brahmana ideas. So that is the terminology that she uses because then there can be wider applicability. But at the same time, in terms of the nature is taken into consideration in terms of the career, but the, the rules are not there. For example, for a Shudra cannot uh, have yeah. money, you know, cannot have. So is the real Vardashram of Yeah, the, that's we right. We don't follow the rules that we have. The, that was the Asuric Vardashram where there's no rules, and then if you don't have the rules, you can't elevate yeah. the system. Yeah, so, so I'm wondering where, you know, how can we apply all this? So we can take the elements of the Varnashram, yeah. but, you know, putting everything together, yeah. even in a, in a devotee community, yeah. how does it look like? That is a kind of. Yeah, so if you want a devotee community kind of based on some of the aspects of Varnashram, yes, uh, you can do the occupational duties fine. Uh, but you cannot apply all the rules because then you can say that those are the suitors they can uh, they can drink and they can do that we don't want that do we <laughs> in Iskon <laughs> they don't have to follow the four regular principles the suitors and Vaishas maybe when you're Kshatri you follow uh, three out of two out of three or <laughs> three out of two out of four or something <laughs> and only when you're the Brahmana then you follow so you have a few devotees following the regulator principles everybody else is not following that doesn't look right proper in Iskon so that doesn't look like the proper way of doing it so we do have to have very strict rules from the top, bo bottom to the top. Uh, you know, the, the uh, peculiar nature of this is because they're all doing bhakti, they're actually beyond the Varnashram system. So they're only doing those activities not because of gunas, but simply they have certain uh, talents as far as being a devotee. 
in certain, uh, which kind of uh, correspond to the occupational duties of the different castes, that's all. Uh, but we shouldn't think in terms of gunas, because that's limiting them, again, putting them back into a lower category. Whereas if you're a devotee, even the mlachu who chants the holy name is better than the brahmana. So then it's like contradictory. So therefore, that system cannot be governed by the same rules as the original varnashram, which the rules are there to elevate you to sattva gun. That's it. <laughs> but we don't want those rules to elevate people to sattva gun, because technically the person who's doing bhakti, even if he's doing a sudra occupation, is better than a brahman already. So then what's the use of those rules? He's on a higher level, actually. So therefore, we can just take the occupational duties, that's about it, that's the varnashram for us, but all those other rules, they don't make too much sense. Huh? As I said, we can take other rules, uh, rules in terms of um, body, cleanliness, diet, all those things we can take, uh, but not applying it to diff making it different for the different groups because they're all devotees. <laughs> and uh, social rules, again, for grihasas, you know, samskars, etc. That much we can take. But then the other rules, I don't know how much you're going to implement, which are the majority of the rules. Uh, rules of occupation, restrictions, etc., and freedoms or whatever. And then um, the daily duties. And if we were to do the daily duties, everyone would say, oh, you're a smart one now. <laughs> if you're following the Brahminical duties of a, a Brahmana, they look quite different from the duties of ISKCON devotees, you know? Quite, quite different. So. Uh, we don't want to follow that either, so basically 80% uh, of it we're not going to follow. <laughs> so what are we going to follow? Probably just the occupational duties, that's it. That would be it. The other things wouldn't make much sense to us. That's, that's what I understand anyway. So then how much of our ashram is that actually? <laughs> they're doing the material world also already. <laughs> According to their ability, they're getting engaged in different work anyway. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's one attitude. Uh, the other thing about the farms, of course, is there. Uh, so, of course, um, good, but obviously a farming community is basically a Vaisha community uh, to uh, uh, protect the cows and farm. So that's actually a Vaisha activity. So therefore, you need a prominence of Vaishas to do that work, not the Brahmanas and the others, you know. Uh, maybe some sutras <laughs> to plow the fields for you. <laughs> but then as far as the brahmanas, it's a little difficult because uh, they'll look at the brahmana who's not working at all and they'll say, well, what are you doing here? You've got to work too. <laughs> We're doing all the work and you're sitting there getting, eating all the food. <laughs> so it wouldn't, be, you know, it wouldn't be a very equal system that way. So it's very difficult to have that system operate with all the four varnas in it. It's very, very difficult, I think. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the nice class. Maharaj, you mentioned that we shouldn't like reject everything in the material world, otherwise that won't be bhakti, we'll still have a tinge of liberation in that. But we see in Chaitanya Charita Amrita, Rupa and Sanatana Goswami, they reject everything, their position in the palace. Oh, yes. and and they come to bhakti. So then, um, why did they why did they reject everything? Why couldn't okay. they like continue and yeah. add Krishna to whatever they were doing? Yeah. So this is according to qualification. If you're qualified for extreme renunciation, you can do it. Uh, if you're not, you don't. So yes, Rupa and Sanata they were highly qualified because they're actually nitya siddhas, <laughs> uh, but they played the role of being degraded uh, employees of uh, Muslims. <laughs> so they're definitely less than sudra occupation in one sense, but they were not that position at all because it's also described that they were actually listening to Bhagavatam all day anyway. So, uh, but simply by circumstance they were in that. But they were highly qualified, so they were qualified for that type of of extreme renunciation which they showed in Vrindavan where they sat under the tree like the python and food came they took and they didn't, they didn't care. Uh, so they were qualified for that. We see that other associates of Lord Chaitanya quite different. Uh, so all the people of Nabadweep were the followers of Lord Chaitanya but they didn't renounce anything. Uh, they continued their duties as householders whether they're Brahmin, Kshatriyas, Vaishya, Sudras. Uh, but they were a completely dedicated to Lord Chaitanya at the same time. So they performed their bhakti, but they did not renounce. 
That again uh, doesn't mean that they were less advanced because they were also nitisidas. <laughs> But they were also setting an example for people that uh, bhakti can be performed in any situation, any varna, any ashram, or outside the whole system, and still you can get the highest success. So therefore, they stayed there, and Lord Chaitanya didn't tell them they have to renounce or become like Rupa and Sanatana at all. He didn't even emphasize that. But So that's just to show that everybody could practice and get the highest success. Um, Maharaj, um, if we consider Prabhupada's desire to um, <clears throat> to um, fulfill Lord Chaitanya's desire that his name be chanted in every town and village, um, specifically in the West, um, um, do we need to acknowledge, in the in the sense of the duties? Uh, of mankind, um, the um, the genius of uh, Lord Chaitanya's uh, <clears throat> in distributing Krishna Prem without condition throughout the world, and w we try to continue that that um, uh, his mercy somehow or other. So, um, although we're faced with probably an Asuric vana, vana, vana shram in the West, um, because everything, f can we argue that because everything flows down from bhakti, that is the saving grace? Oh, well, you know, the, the process of bhakti is such that uh, you can operate within the Varna ashram system, but bhakti is equally accessible outside the Varnashram system, in other words, the Asura Varnashram or wherever it's in the Western world, bhakti uh, can be applied to anybody and you can be successful. So um, we don't have to worry that, okay, people in the West, at first they have to adopt the Varnashram system, then they can do bhakti. If we tried to do that, we would be working for you know, thousands of years <laughs> trying to make a Varnashram system for people to purify them, then they take to devotional service. So they just take to bhakti and chant the holy name they can get the success that way. Uh, and why it works is that through the process of bhakti, we fulfill all the functions of that system and surpass it. So as I mentioned, Bhagavatam says, by simply by chanting the holy name of the Lord purely once, you surpass the Brahmana. <laughs> so therefore, the person in the Western world or Eastern world or wherever, uh, not following the Varna Ashram system, they take to the chanting of the holy name, practice the process of bhakti, they quickly rise up above the whole system and they're purer than anybody in the Varnashram system. So they've accomplished whatever goal that Varnashram system uh, accomplishes, plus they get more because they become devotees of Krishna. <laughs> huh? So uh, everything is fulfilled by the process of bhakti. So they don't have to distract themselves by trying to do all this other stuff as well. Okay. Hare Krishna. Yeah.